Well, hello there and good evening. Um, my name is Madeline Hennigan. I'm one of the co-directors of Writing on the Wall. And it's my absolute pleasure this evening to welcome you to Wowfest Lockdown, a unique online festival designed to respond to and get us through these unprecedented times that we find ourselves in. So whether you're a regular supporter of Wowfest or whether you're new to our work, we're very pleased to have you with us tonight, virtually with us in your homes and in our homes. If you're a regular supporter of WOW, you'll know that at this, this time of year, we're usually running around venues in Liverpool city centre, delivering our month long annual writing festival. But like festivals across the world, we were left with no choice but to cancel our live events in the face of this global pandemic. It was a hard thing to do, particularly in our 20th anniversary year. But the one team are a tenacious and creative lot. And so from the safety of our own homes, we've been working hard to pull together Wildfest lockdown. And over the next three weeks, we'll be considering some of the burning and crucial questions around the pandemic and exploring how creativity can help us not only to survive, but to flourish at this time. And joining us, we have an, imp an impressive array of local, national and international guests, artists, commentators, poets, filmmakers, journalists. Um, I'm sure you agree the lineup is amazing. There's too many festival guests mentioned right here and right now. Um, but just to say that on Sunday, we have A.L. Kennedy, short, award winning short story writer, who's joining us as part of Kit Deval's Big Book Weekend. Followed next week by Francesca Martinez, comedian and activist, and her brother, um, Ram Martinez, writer and philosopher. From the front line, we've got Bob Gill with his, Dr. Bob Gill with his important film from the, the great NHS heist, and also Javier Butt, Dr. Mona Camel, May a Goodfellow, and local writer Emmy on Euro will be looking at the disproportionate of impact of the pandemic on Black and Asian communities. And as you can imagine, we're very proud that one of the world's greatest theorists and writers, Noam Chomsky, will be returning to Wildfest after many years to deliver a letter from America. And considering some of the crazy behaviours and messages coming out of the United States at the moment, I'm sure he's going to have a lot to say, so don't miss that one. Also on board, we have Stu McConey, renowned theatre critic Lynn Gardner, mirror journalist Brian Reed, federal social justice campaigner Phil Scraton's coming back again, and we've got Liverpool poet spotlight on Liverpool talent, Amina Atik, Ash Nugent, and Urban Grio, Levi Tafari. And if you've seen the special announcement today, you'll know that we have the one and only Jeremy Corbyn, who will be issuing a call to arts on the 31st of May. You can check out the whole programme at wildfest.uk. So before I hand over um, to my co-director, Mike Morris, who's going to introduce this evening's fabulous event, I just want to say thanks to our festival funders and sponsors who've been incredibly important in these different supportive in these difficult times. Arts Council England, Liverpool City Council, Edge Hill University, Unison Northwest, and Liverpool John Moores University. And I'd like to say huge thanks to all of you who've donated to this free festival so far. Um, and you can still donate um, throughout the month on the live link posted. Um, all donations are split, will be split between fan support and food banks, South Liverpool Domestic Abuse Services and Writing on the Wall. So I thank you for joining us this evening. I hope you'll be with us for the month and I'll now hand you over to my co-director, Mike Morris. Hi, thanks Madeline. 
Um, I'm here tonight to introduce our host for Evan Welsh. We're really pleased to be joined by the lead singer of the farm, Peter Hooten. Uh, you will know they're on Themic single all together now. Um, you will also know that they've had a whole series of albums, uh, one of which reached number one in the album charts. Peter himself is a, a writer and author. He's done a number of books, in uh, including sorry, uh, the the Boot Room Boys. Sorry, uh, he was the editor of the legendary uh, Liverpool magazine at the end. He's also um, been. And you may have seen this most recently on the BBC, executive producer of a fantastic documentary about the Liverpool manager Bill Shankly uh, called uh, Nature's Fire. He was also a, a tireless campaigner for the uh, 96, uh, for justice for the 96 of the people who died in Hillsborough. He's a great friend of the, uh, the festival and uh, we're really pleased that he could join us. And we're delighted as well that we've got Irvin Welsh back again to the festival, great friend of the festival, who's been here on a number of occasions. It's a really special night for us, our first ever completely digital online live festival uh, event. So kind of history in the making as well. And we couldn't think of two better people to have started this for us and to kick off our Wildfest Lockdown Festival to keep you entertained and informed and keep you talking and discussing things throughout this uh, this unique uh, period that we're going through. So thanks very much. And I'm going to hand over now to Peter Hooten. Hi, right, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Madeline, for the introductions. Um, I don't know how to follow that. I think everyone wants to really hear what Evan's got to say, but... Um... What can you say about Evan Welsh? You know, the inimitable, irrepressible Evan Welsh, known to his friends as that, that cavorting charlatan. Um, he's basically, you know, he, he's a cult figure. Uh, and unbelievably on my Facebook come up last night that he was DJing um, the same time last year in, uh, in Liverpool. So who would have thought that, you know, uh, a year later we'd be in this situation, the pandemic. So I'd just like to introduce Evan. Um, let's get into the Q and A. Uh, I feel like I'm in the cabinet or the select committee, but I don't know where it is. Evan coming onto the screen, but uh, well, maybe maybe we should be in the cabinet. Me and Evan maybe should be in the cabinet. You know, uh, I think we do a better job, don't you, Evan? <laughs> uh, it's probably about the only thing that can make the situation worse, mate. You and me fucking running the show like, you know, <laughs> this, for fuck's sake, like, you know, but uh, they'd really know what the, what it hit them if we took over. Yeah. So um, you're based, you're in Edinburgh at the moment, aren't you, but, uh, Yes, I am. Yeah. I've kind of, the musical shares, I kind of um, I landed here when it all kicked off. So I've just stopped yeah. here, basically. And, uh, so you couldn't escape? Yeah, no, I've been working away and it's like, you know, it's kind of self-isolation is what you do in the writing game anyway when you get into that critical mass for the project. Yeah. I've been just getting on with things like, you know. So the creative juice has been flowing? Has this been the... Yeah, like, it's, been the, you know, it's been more graft. It's, you, know, the, you know, you get the, as you know, you, you get the stages of any project you do, you start off with the creative stuff and then you just have the solid graft to kind of put it all together. And this is like the kind of solid graft part, you know, which I'm, I'm yeah. less good at than the creative stuff. So, yeah. so it's like the fun stuff is gone. There's so just solid work, but it needs to be done. So I don't mind it. Yeah. And have you have you been um, following government guidelines, going out for one one piece of exercise a day? I've been tracking your phone. I yeah, I've been, you've been of, two, uh, two or three times, maybe. I've been pretty good. Like, you know, it's um, <clears throat> like anything else. It takes a bit of getting used to. And uh, I've not I've tried not to be tried to be tolerant of other people, not be too fascist about it. And uh, but I've also tried to observe the kind of um, yeah. the, the guidelines, you know. God, I'm making myself out to be the same the goody two shoes figure. Ain't, ain't I? <laughs> but You're yeah, right. I'm doing my best. You know, it's sometimes it's usually good enough. Sometimes it's kind of you forget. You know, uh, in the supermarket, you find yourself kind of sort of bumping into people and thinking, think, yeah. "What are you doing here?" You're just just because you're not concentrating, like you know, I've got my the headphones on or some. How's the shop? How's the shoplifting going? Shoplift is great. You know, I mean, it's like they're they're so they're they're, they're so into the. Um, Making sure people aren't bumping into each other, they forget about people like myself, you know, just <laughs> people in their boots. So it's all good, mate. All good. I think the big question everyone wants answered, though, is uh, do you wear a mask? We all wear masks, mate. <clears throat> we just, you know, we, we have, 
We all wear masks of some one description or another. <laughs> yeah, but actually, do you put one of the masks on to go into the shop, or have you? It's the first time I've, you know, it's actually the first time that I've kind of worn a mask uh, to go shopping and never been chased by the police. So, you know, so that's quite a kind of novel thing. So you're saying you've been going on your uh, daily walks with, uh, you meeting up with friends at all? Or? Yeah, yeah, there's a couple of us in the neighbourhood. We kind of, um, we sort of um, kind of, you know, we get together for the, the social distancing walk and the social distancing coffee and all that, you know, and it's, it's quite nice. Your, your, your whole life kind of shrinks to a little village type of thing, you know. Uh, you only go a few blocks away. So, yeah, I'm, I'm actually quite enjoying it. As, as I said on Twitter, I've, I've got a little bit of thriver's guilt. You know, I'm kind of quite, um, I'm quite liking this. I'm liking the excuse to get down to some graft. And I'm liking the, I like the, I like the sounds that are coming back. You know, the sounds of yeah, nature. Yeah. The song. And all that. And, uh, Bird song, yeah. yeah. Getting more into looking at trees and stuff like that. You know, I'll yeah. start having them soon, like, you know. Get I think time. everyone is. And I think, you know, obviously pollution's uh, decreased, hasn't it? And everyone's out on the bikes. You know, it's it's funny because I've felt healthier than I've ever, I've ever felt in Edinburgh because uh, all the pollutants have gone from the air, and you know, so my hay fever usually kills me at this time. Yeah. Like, you know, everybody thinks I've been doing tons of coke, and I keep telling them it's just hay fever. Like, you know, so <laughs> it's like so so it's like this time of the year, you know, I've no, you know, it's it's been fantastic. You know. Yeah. So what what are you actually working on at the moment then, Evan? Is it a new book or? Yeah, we've got some TV stuff to do, and I've got I've got a book to finish. So, um, like Dean Cavanaugh and myself are getting on with some TV scripts, and uh, we're kind of um, I'm finishing this book, and um, got some TV stuff in America as well, you know. So I'm just yeah. kind of basically what's, pressing on. Yeah. What's the uh, What's the book? Is it a continuation of Dead Man's Shoes? I'm or? not going to tell you, buddy. I'm not going to tell oh, you. Oh come on! That, that, that hex is it, you know. <laughs> you start doing all that kind of stuff. You were working on a film though about uh, the creation story with Alan McKay. Yeah, right? it's Is all that, done. It's all done. We're that. just, um, I think we had, um, we had one scene to kind of reshoot and I think we've kind of, um, we've probably, once the lockdown eases, we'll just do that, but it's only a couple of minutes at the most of footage. So, um, yeah. so we'd be, you know, we, uh, we're basically all done apart from that. I think the, you know, the sound mix has kind of uh, been done and everything like that. So it's just a matter of um, looking at, um, Get you know when people can get back into the cinema because the cinemas are going to be the last thing you know either going to be even later than the pubs and sort of um, they're going to be the last thing that reopens so yeah, when yeah. it will actually be seen I don't know that's kind of out of our hands really but um, mm -hmm. it's almost done you know it's practically done yeah did you write this did you do the script for that or was it yeah yeah myself and Dean did the script for it and um, we're very you know very you know obviously you do say that you know you feel kind of but I'm very proud of this one I think it's a really good movie it's very um, it captures the mood and the times and the characters and um, it's good kind of solid performances from the actors and it's got that kind of a little bit of kind of verb and sort of shuffle about it like you know yeah yeah so in when when is the release date or is that being put back with the pandemic is that all being up in the air now is it yeah it's up in the air mate you know we're just have to see when people are out back in the cinemas again on mass you know? yeah yeah. So in in the lockdown, during the lockdown, have you been looking at Netflix or any stuff? No, like I've not. I've not. I've not. I've not, I've not had a TV switch on once. I don't think. You know, I've been. I've started to get into reading again, and listening to albums. I listen to some an old album, pick it in the morning, and listen to it in the evening, and I look forward to doing that all day, and uh, just get into doing that. You know, and reading and all that. I find. I'm finding it. My concentration levels are coming back because I'm not messing around on the internet or online all the time now, yeah. Hello. Yeah, in terms of a um, bit of a technical gap there, in terms of the dog was back and so I muted it. Right. Do you the dog I, thought, I, thought, I thought you would be responsible for the technical gap. I don't <laughs> think it would be the, the technical people at WOW. <laughs> So in terms of, uh, in terms of, you know, what would you see in the next few months happening? I mean, can you, I mean, I know it's all speculation, but what could you see in the next few months? I'm just going to tell you in my little speech, if you, um, buddy. All right, okay. Right, so shall I go ahead and do that then, yeah? All right, okay, yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, then I'll, I'll fire on. Uh, creativity in the time of chaos. Kind of well, I mean, it is a nice thought, but um, the problem with chaos 
is kind of justifiably that when it looms, people tend to think more in terms of be, of survival, of basic survival, rather than being creative, you know, and, and so they should too. Um, my own experience, I grew up from that generation of working class artists where spells in the dole gave us time to process all the shit that we've been through, uh, to get together in kind of pubs and cafes, and those were the kind of salons, those were the kind of boot camps of creative interaction. Uh, and also to kind of hone those rudimentary skills. Now, not to get a bit kind of too rose tinted about this era, but you did have things like the tax rebate, the one pound night school courses, the university fees, and full grants paid to plebs like myself. Um, so it was far from milk and honey, but you kind of got the best of both creative worlds. You got to struggle, but um, you also got a bit of time out from the struggle so you could kind of reflect on it. And crucially, what you didn't have, and I think this is the thing that kind of crushes both politics and art and youth, is that deep existential threat of debt. And I think because we live in a debt or economy and debt or society, that now young citizens are, pro are kind of basically property of the corporate state. They're basically born into indentured servitude in order to pay off debts incurred for education, housing, and in some countries, healthcare. So the relationship between the individual and state is always one that's troubled me because ultimately I think that a truly creative citizenry is a free citizenry. And I think we, we can't, you know, once you start putting shackles on people, then, uh, the creativity starts to be limited. Once you start putting kind of, um, not just censorship, but also kind of broader cultural shackles and also kind of marketing shackles when uh, culture is being stuck into a kind, into kind of marketing holes for a, a kind of entertainment industry. So I think the issue for many of us uh, now is how do we get a break from the kind of swirling chaos of financial economic and environmental collapse to make the time to be creative, to kind of get our creative brains working and kind of flex our creative muscles. And finally, for a lot of people, not for all, for everybody, but for kind of sort of quite lucky people like myself, quite privileged people, the lockdown has ironically provided that kind of space. And for others, it doesn't, it just exacerbates existing issues of family tensions, financial demands. So if you have got that kind of space, you're really fortunate, you should be trying to use it. So the next thing we have to kind of consider is what do we need to do to ensure we start producing kind of real art again, rather than simply the distractions of big kind of entertainment, of the big kind of capitalist mainstream entertainment industry. And I'm proposing a kind of, um, not so much a kind of, not so much a kind of socialist model, more of an anarchist model. Um, so I've been inspired by the growing numbers of working class communities who have kind of been neglected by the state in favour of the interests of developers and big capital. This is a kind of local government, national government level. Um, and they've simply accepted that the state that they're relevant to the state but the state is also relevant to them and uh, the helping hands group for example in my native city of edinburgh with its ethos of solidarity not charity is showing the way to go in terms of communities not just kind of feeding each other but also organizing sport and now moving into cultural events um kind of re uh, reading and literary events and this is kind of simply to me the, the way to go uh, to accept that over the last kind of 40 years that working class people have been made irrelevant to the state, unless you have a crisis like this and suddenly they become heroes again. Um, and just let that cut both ways, basically. So I see the future of creativity um, and kind of of politics is primarily, as I say, as an anarchist um, rather than a socialist or liberal construct. I don't necessarily see it about being about more begging bowl grants, policed by politically correct gatekeepers with a social engineering agenda. I think the facilities 
and access to them have to be local. I'm thinking about kind of things like um, libraries and schools have to be utilised more as centres of creativity. Um, and uh, I'm just recalling that uh, a few years back doing a discussion with a guy called Daniel Jaju, who was the communist mayor of Santiago in Chile. And what happened was when they took control uh, in Santiago, they decided what they would do rather than the usual kind of local government stuff. They decided that they would split up the city's budget and let the locals spend it on what they wanted. So the city hall would be there to assist, but only on kind of technical and implementation matters rather than the policy itself. And so basically people would just decide what they wanted to spend the money on. You know, they, they would go, here's a chunk of, of money for your neighborhood. This is for your budget. This is, there's not gonna be any more when you spend this. You have to take responsibility for spending it. Um, so see what you see what you want to spend it on. And we'll help in the city hall, but we're not gonna tell you what to do or what to spend it on. You've got to do that yourself. Um, and what was interesting was that how much people valued education in the arts, as much as the kind of meat and potatoes services like housing, cleansing, uh, road sweeping, etc. And so I see the future of culture as being something like that. I see it as being something that's community based rather than marketing led. And I see it as, you know, it's not a kind of capitalist or liberal or socialist construct. I see it as incubating there in the underground again in the local community. I don't want everything thrown out into a global marketplace to be quickly sold uh, off and then this kind of relentless kind of hunt for the next big thing which is kind of found and then some, suddenly kind of, um, you know, eviscerated by the, the entertainment industry into some kind of bland fucking shit that has us nodding our heads like little toy dogs in the back of a car when it should be making our cocks hard and our fannies fucking gush. Um, so that's the kind of culture that I want to see. I want to see a kind of dangerous, risky kind of sort of um, culture operating at kind of, um, not even at street level, but at community level and kind of owned by the community, promoted by the community and then breaking out from there organically. So we have to accept that technology is going to continue to lower wages and profits to zero. It's going to continue to destroy paid work. There's nothing we can do about this. But there's nothing we really should do about it either. You know, we, we, we should see it as a kind of liberating process. We should see it as a, as a, as a chance to do more creative stuff, to express ourselves, to self-actualize, instead of being wait to being told what to do by somebody in a factory or an office. So we need to get used to this chaos and we need to stop fearing change, I think, and being manipulated into a right-wing media, into, oh, isn't this terrible? And because, no, it's not. It's actually pretty fucking brilliant. Um, when we stand aside of our fears and start to take responsibility for ourselves and out of the hands of the self-serving, overprivileged simpletons and also the well-meaning but pompous bores who want to replace them, only then can we start to have a vibrant culture again. So what we need to facilitate all that are basically these new boot camps of interaction that I talked about. I mean, you can, le what you, you can learn to do everything on YouTube you can express every single thought on Twitter, but what you can't learn, you can learn to do, but what you can't learn is how to be, how to be with other people. And that's when creativity really starts to flow, when you're being with other people and you're sparking off ideas from them. Um, and so we have to create these new boot camps of interaction and they're offline, they're largely offline. Online, as we're learning through our lockdown, through our Zoom meetings, and our fitness sessions, our high intensity training, our shadow boxing, these things can only augment, they can't replace. Now, the good news is that people are already doing this. There's a proliferation of com the community festival, the, the book group, the local band scene. And partly because the internet's become so crowded and boring that we can't wait to get away from it and just see people again. And I think that's one of the the big kind of take homes we're going to get from the from the lockdown. Um, you know, we will use technology, but we will use it, hopefully we'll use it more judiciously and we'll start to take an interest in our communities again and in our face-to-face -face relationships. You know, and you're thinking that um, it's like, you know, I've, I've, because I've traveled so much and I've kind of um, been around, I've made lots of great friends from all over the world, but I'm getting to that thing of thinking now, 
I would like to actually spend quality time with fewer people again than just kind of shoot around the world and kind of see everybody and get be in all these kind of networks. So anyway, I'll continue to be creative or continue to try and strive to be creative, but it won't be inspired by a book I've read or it won't be inspired by a kind of, um, you know, or some kind of, it would be not so much by a book I've read or, a, you know, a piece of music that I've heard, but it'll be about um, some kind of animated discussion with those things with somebody in a pub or a coffee house. And that's what we need. We need places where people can come together, kind of talk shit and then go off and actually do some fucking proper shit. And without some cunt of a politician gazing down on us and telling us to mind our tone or that we're doing incredibly well and being ever so brave. So the best thing about chaos is that it has pushed a lot of inadequate venal fuckers into our faces. And we look on horribly fascinated watching them try to sort out the mess that they've created down the years. So now it's the time to do what all true creative people do kick against those fucking pricks and ultimately that's how we survive and that's how we thrive and I think that'll kind of do me an observation now and uh, let's have a wee blada buhuto Thank you Evan a party political broadcast on behalf of which party? Um, the the right party. party the right to party buddy yeah. Uh, okay, we've got a few questions coming through. This this is uh, um, this is a pretty good one. Do either of you see an impact of urban gentrification in the home cities and the culture of each place? Well, you know, I give that to you, um, for for Edinburgh. Well, that was you know you realise in your accent that urban and urban sound exactly the same. So I thought you said urban gentrification there, like you know. So um. But there's no gentrification here, mate. You know, I'm I'm still low life. But yeah, no, I, mean, I don't know. Talk about the city itself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I don't know. I'm not sure what's um what's gonna what, how it's gonna work out there. I think that uh, what I've noticed with the lockdown is that uh, going through Leith, that all the students um, and all the kind of um, the nouveau people seem to have gone. They seem to have just left town, basically. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's That's what happened in the play. <laughs> it's like going back to the 70s, being a kid and all that, watching all the the, the guys hanging around in street corners yeah. and stuff like that. You know, it's got a kind if of you, if you read, got a kind of dirty vibe back again. So I'm quite enjoying them. Yeah. If you read uh, Council the, of the Great Play, that's what happened in London, didn't it? People yeah. moved out of London, you know. Yeah, and I, it might continue. I mean, I think that um, cities have become kind of seen again is, uh, you know, because it was a trendy thing to move into the city. It was a trendy thing to kind of gentrify and to have all these kind of sort of uh, working class kind of areas that were, you know, that, and make them into kind of posh, kind of nice little places. We've got the, we have the benefits of the city and it's wonderful and it's great. <laughs> and I think I think a lot of these people will be off like a fucking shot. You know, they'll be thinking, oh my God, no, it's full of plague and pestilence and disease. We've got to get into the country. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and also you look at places like, um, you know, the Southwest has got, you know, very few cases, hasn't it? Uh, the Southwest yeah, I mean, it's, it's, all, it's, it's like any contagion. It just spreads through people, doesn't it? And, you know, the, 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 the yeah. The kind of more concentrated it gets, the more likely you you know you are to to get into yeah. that kind of. I've thing. I've seen locals there saying we don't want these people coming from the uh, the metropolis, you know, into uh, the second homes in Cornwall. Can you pre you can understand that? Can't yeah, you? of course. Why should they? Like you know, how do you think? Uh, one of the questions is how do you think Bed B would uh, react to the lockdown? Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. He'd be in prison by now for battering his missus, or he would be kind of... Um, is anyone still getting arrested, though? Sorry? Is anyone still getting arrested, though? I mean, the police... I don't know. I've, I've never seen... I don't see my, many police. I've never, I've never seen any coppers on the street. Um, I've seen a lot of kind of uh, groups of young guys wearing masks and kind of going very slow and casing joints, and I've seen uh, lots of JKs kind of arguing and shouting and screaming on the streets. I've seen tons of traffic wardens. I don't know what, what it is. Maybe it's just kind of maybe it's just a part of Embry I live in. But um, it's like I've not seen many. Uh, I've not seen many mm. coppers at all. Yeah. 
Yeah. So another question is, uh, has the lockdown changed the way in which you work? Creativity versus graft? Well, I mean, I think it's like, uh, that's a kind of good question because I've been... Um, I've been taking advantage, you know, I'm at the kind of stage now where I'm writing, you know, the stuff I'm writing, I've just got to sit down and do it. I can't kind of basically fanny about and pretend that I'm writing anymore. You know, it's like you can, which is the great, the great thing about being a writer, you know, you've got to stop doing the, the kind of bar stool writing, you know, you can sit around and you can pontificate about all the, the books and screenplays you're going to write and you can get these, all these ideas and discuss things. But there's a time where you actually have to sit down in a room and do it. And uh, I was actually approaching that time anyway, in the, you know, in the, in the project cycle, really. Mm. So it hasn't really made a lot of difference to me. It's actually just forced me into doing what I would be doing anyway. Yeah. Uh, another question. Um, what advice do you have for someone beginning to pursue a career as a writer? Um, I think the, the, one of the most important things, I think, and I wish I'd kind of... Um, I wish somebody had told me this when I started out. Major probably wouldn't have started out, but but um, the I think one of the things that um, is to know yourself basically, and it's like uh, it's a funny game because you've got to be a real a, a strange kind of split personality, a mixture of kind of extrovert and introvert. You know, you've got to like kind of um, going out and meeting people because you draw and you feed off kind of sort of social situations. If you're especially if you're a writer like me, I'm not a research based writer. I'm more of an immersive kind of Mm. Uh, character um, but you've also got to like your own company as well so because you, you've got to spend a lot of time on your own um, and a lot of people kind of uh, they think to themselves I mean I've you know I've, I've kind of when I've taught kind of courses in creative writing you've seen people who could sit in bar stools and talk about the great novels they're going to write kind of uh, all day long but to actually sit in the room that part of it, to sit in the room and write it, they're kind of lost to go crazy. They can't yeah. actually handle that. So the most important thing I would think in anybody embarking um, mm. on, a, on writing or thinking about it as a career is make sure that you can, sp can spend a lot of time on your own. If you can't do that, um, try something that's more collaborative. You know, try like music or an art problem that involves you kind of getting getting involved with other people. Or try, if you're going to write, try writing specific, try writing for television or film rather than a novel because you're kind of going to be spending a lot more time with other people in that process with like kind of um, producers um, yeah. and as you try, as you develop scripts. Whereas like a novel, you're pretty much on your own. You're just, you know, that, that's the great thing about it. It's also the bad thing about it. Following on from that question from me, I mean, what inspired you to write? Did you write at all? Or at school or did, what inspired you to actually put pen to paper? Yeah, I was kind of wrote at school, but I never really, you know, it's like when, you, when you're a kind of um, state comprehensive in North Edinburgh, you kind of, you know, you think you're going to be working one of the factories and kind of Parsons yeah. Peebles or Ferrantes or Browns or United Wire. Uh, they're kind of, you know, the school is basically set up for that. Um, and, so, you know, writing is just something that you do to it's part of English and you do that as part of the curriculum, you know, but um, it wasn't seen as a viable career, uh, but um, it kind of, um, it kind of just through a series of accidents, it kind of dawned on me that uh, I'm much better at this than I am about being uh, an apprentice television mechanic, for example, you know, I'm not getting, you know, I'm not getting an electric shock all the time and um, ending up in the hospital, but also I'm not, um, it's like that trade is kind of dead now anyway, you know, mm. so it's like um, things that were kind of seen as, you know, all these all these kind of skilled trades have all gone. And uh, the things that were seen as a bit stupid and poncy, like kind of writing, um, are yeah. now the things that are kind of more, uh, ironically, more vocational. Yeah. Uh, uh, as you've got a bit older, have you noticed the change in your style of writing? Um. Yeah, I think so. I think what you do is that you kind of, um, you exhaust kind of biographical elements of yourself uh, that you draw on and you kind of become more of, um, more of a writer who is um, more of a composer. You, start, you, you stop looking inwards and you start looking out a little bit more. You know, you kind of become a bit more into research and you become a bit more into um, conversations with people and you become a bit more into kind of... Um, into reading and to into watching movies and to, to get characterizations from there rather than your kind of observations like you know because um, yeah. I mean I don't want to 
be basically, you know, I don't want to be kind of living the kind of life whereby I like writing about quite extreme things, but when you get older, you don't want to be living an extreme life. You know, you don't want to be kind of taking tons of drugs and going to kind of um, bizarre kind of sort of um, pubs and sort of uh, underground clubs and all that, you know, only a bit, but not too much, like, you know, so yeah. you can't, you become less um, a kind of, just a natural thing, you become less a person <clears throat> who lives that kind of life, but um, you also have to, I think you have to write more about your life cycle as well. Your characters kind of should grow older with you, I think. Like, you know, you shouldn't be writing. I mean, I, I still do write about characters that are younger than me because I find um, my own life and people that are my own age a little bit boring. You know, it's like a, it's either a repetition of stuff that we've done before yeah. uh, or it's got, or people have gone a bit kind of quieter and live a quieter life. So it's kind of, it doesn't really excite me, but... Um, youth still kind of get fucked up in all different ways and that's kind of quite interesting to me. Mm. Uh, there's been quite a few questions about uh, what writers or novels have you been reading during the lockdown so what new is there any new authors or new writers you've been or you've been too busy doing your own stuff? I've been kind of immersed in my own stuff and you kind of like you, you kind of um you tend to read kind of stuff that is you know going to help you and you know research-based stuff that's going to help you so it's been a bit uh, dull. I've been trying to get into, I've been trying to read the novel. I just kind of, um, I just read this novel again, Dennis Johnson's Tree of Smoke, which is a great book. And, um, you know, so I've been trying to uh, to get back into to novel reading and, you know, it's something that's not going to, I mean, it's not going to take me too far out of what I'm writing, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, another question here about your T-shirt. Can we have a look at your T-shirt properly? Yes, you can, yes. Where, where did you get it from? And is it, is, it, is it Catalan? It's Catalan. It's Barcelona. It's like a kind of... Um, it's, I got it from the, the Barcelona Dockers, um, who um, I was kind of involved in this um, this movie we're, gonna, we're thinking about doing about Cat the Catalan independence and about the, the, um, the, the sort of... Um, the the kind of uh, what what we describe it as the almost like a coup that uh, the Madrid government did the kind you know they had the the, the yeah. Francoist police kind of trying to occupy parts of Barcelona and mm -hmm. stop the stop the referendum which they saw as illegal from taking place and you had this boat which was called the Tweedy Pie um, moored in Barcelona docks and there was all this um, nonsense that was talked about the dockers stopping these kind of um, Franco was pleased from sort of getting out and kind of harassing the population and they were apparently starving to death on the boat, which um, was not was just kind of total fabrication. Um, but this is like, um, I don't know what it's, it, it was explained to me, but it's like a kind of, it's a sexy double entendre, you know, in Catalan. It means something like, um, it's got some se it's got some kind of semi-offensive sexual connotation, but about Barcelona, about Barcelona Dockers, so it's a perfect t-shirt. Oh, okay. I wish I, I wish I knew what the fuck it said, but um, <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't really mean it doesn't mean um, tourists are fed up and people going to work at champagne bar in Barcelona. <laughs> you hear about that? The work at champagne bar? No, no, no. The dockside bar, which a lot of um, a lot I don't of know if the same circles as you do, know, so I kind of um, I don't know about. Um, you know, I, I, champagne bars are a bit out of my class, mate, yeah? Work is champagne bar, that's what Work is champagne bar, great. Um, do you reckon the Tories will be held to account at any point? Who's going to hold them to account? You know, there is nobody. It's like kind of, um, we basically, we're, we're in very conformist com, uh, sort of uh, compliant times. I mean, we kind of, um, not all of us, but basically most people have their heads down. They don't want to mess with authority and... Um, they're content to kind of um, tug the forelock and kind of uh, doff their cap to the kind of... Um, it's gonna, it's almost gone, we're going into a new medievalism, you know, and people are, are frightened to tend not to challenge authority. And it's, this is the very time we should be challenging authority. We've got all these archaic and sort of um, broken systems that are just being held together to represent a very, very small elite. And uh, that's really what the Tory party is and all is always stood for. So it should be kind of challenged and held to account. I mean, it's like, 
it's ridiculous that we have the highest death toll in in Europe. Um, and uh, you know, it's um, it's you know, we were talking about earlier. You were mentioning Vietnam. There's nobody dead there at all. You know, it's incredible that 96 million people and not one death. Um, mm. And you look at what I mean, what New Zealand has done by being yeah. uh, ruthless about this, and they're they're out. You know, they're coming out of it now. They're coming out of it healthy. You know, we're coming out of it kind of broken and. Um, yeah. We've got, we've had our NHS run down for the last 40 years, basically, you know, so hopefully if one good thing comes out of this, it's the value of NHS, it's the value of, of, yeah. of, care, of care workers, and it's the value of local yeah. aid workers in the retail sector. They're the ones that have kept this country going. Uh, it's not been fucking vainglorious billionaires blowing yeah. their own company, you know? Well, that's been the noticeable thing, that it's the essential workers, isn't it, that everyone's relying yeah. upon. Where the bankers and the hedge fund managers are nowhere to be seen, aren't they? Yeah, well, no, nobody needs them. They're not fucking essential yeah, at all. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But uh, in terms of the, the clapping on uh, Thursday night at eight o'clock, have you been involved in that? Would you, do you see that as. Yeah, I think it's a great thing. You know, it's like, um, and it's funny because. Um, this street that I'm in here, kind of, it's not what you would, it's not what you would call a kind of. Um, a kind of sort of working class community and all that, but um, everybody's out, you know, and it's, you know, there's a, it's, a, it's a mixture of kind of, um, kind of quite kind of wealthy people, kind of students, yeah. um, you know, it's a, and, uh, and, and, you know, and working class people as well, a lot of kind of, you know, sort of, um, there's a, a lot of guys that are doing St. James's Centre, live upstairs in one of the flats, and uh, it's just been a, a massively uplifting and heartening display of solidarity, yeah. and, uh, no matter how much kind of, it's actually the antithesis of what the government about, and it's, yeah. it's nauseating them, them trying pathetically to hijack that. But yeah. uh, I mean, there is a, a sense that this is really people kind of speaking and kind of, um, and it's straight from the heart, and we're valuing kind yeah. of um, real people doing real jobs instead of yeah. well, well, kind of messing think, around on the internet was shifting yeah. money back and forward. But what do you think though when you see the politicians coming out of you know into Down Street clapping? I mean, I know they're, just, they're, they're completely irrelevant. You know, it's completely irrelevant. It's just this yeah. kind of um, it's it's all show, it's all facade. They're they're doing nothing, and uh, they're just you know the uh, and it's kind of um, it's an incredibly diff difficult situation. But you want people who are very kind of switched on and have a, a broad kind of humanitarian understanding of the issues. If you look at somebody like uh, Jacinda Arndon in New Zealand, you know, she's basically shitting over all these vampires that we have here in Britain and America, uh, yeah. basically just because she's a real person, you mm. know? Um, yeah, there's a question here about the NHS. Do you think the, um, what's be, do you think anarchic writing and, um, and journalism can, can help the NHS from being privatised, or do you think? Well, I think we've all got, you know, we've got, we've got to value it, you know, and I think that, um, and it's, you know, the, the the journalism in Britain has been incredibly poor. It's been so sycophantic, and you know, people, have, you know, have become stenographers for the government. It's a, it's the worst form of propaganda. The broadcast media is not that much better, you know. It's like the BBC has become massively. Kind of compromised it's is like kind of um pravda now basically and uh it's you know so we we really have to kind of it's more important than ever that we're critical rather than supine and um you know so i think that uh yeah. we need we need kind of fearless voices in journalism definitely yeah. uh, and, and the thing great, the great thing about the internet uh, even though is when uh, lots of politicians were clapping the NHS, uh, all sorts of things on Twitter and Facebook about when they were cheering, not to give them a pay rise. That, that can be the power of the internet, can't it? You know? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's like, you know, um, but I think, you know, the, the, the main problem is that so many people have become deferential to, uh, to, to particularly money and power and yeah. it's vectored kind of perfectly with our sort of... Um, or kind of reality TV kind of culture and all that, where the bigger, you know, basically the bigger, uh, the, the more of an asshole somebody is, the more people are interested in seeing them in a position of power because it's almost like a kind of form of strange entertainment, you know? You yeah. don't know what this idiot's going to do or say next, but it's kind of, um, it's become costly to life now. You know, mm -hmm. it's become costly having an idiot, a, a, 
an absolute clown like Trump. It's become costly having a fool like Johnson. And it's no surprise that these two countries are the very, very worst uh, yeah. cases in the world, in the, very, in the places where people are going to die the most, you know. So um, it's not, when, when you have a, a sick or elderly relative or, you know, that's, that's passing away, mm. you, can't, you know, you, you can keep, you know, uh, or you have a frontline carers who are trying to save them who are dying. Yeah. Um, the joke wears thin, you know, and we can't, we, we have to get a little bit serious about this. We can't keep putting jokers up and expecting them to do a job, you know, a, a real kind of person's job, because they're not up to it. Yeah, it's really exposed to uh, the limitations, really, isn't it? But I think yeah. if you look at the, the newspaper that we don't like to mention, um, the headline today was Happy Mondays. And uh, that's about the lockdown getting uh, eased over the weekend. But, you know, just imagine if you've got uh, elderly parents who died in a care home or reading that headline, it's just... It's, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, but yeah, again, it's like sort of, um, you know, you, you, if we come out, if, if, if we come out this too early and then it's like the numbers go up, you know, we're in this kind of, this, this kind of really, really weird situation where it's just going to lead to more kind mm. of oppression and more powers that the state are going to grab. Uh, so, there, you know, there's no easy way out of this at all. And, yeah. uh, you know, we, we've kind of... Um, because we messed up at the start, or because they messed up, the government messed up at the start, we're playing catch up with the situation now, which, you know, is, is no good. What do you think about the, you know, conspiracy theorists on the internet? Or, um, I can't be arsed with all that shit. I mean, it's like, I always think that, um, you know, the, the whole economy of the world is a conspiracy of the 1% against the rest of us. So mm -hmm. if you just look at it in that way, the rest is just details, and I can't be kind of um, bothered focusing on these kind of details. So you haven't got pseudonyms on the internet with uh, pseudonyms so sort of like arguing with people on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> There's an idea. Uh, um, another question here. Are you optimistic that we can return to a sense of community after the lockdown? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I am. Because as, as I said in the, the earlier there, it was like, um, I think that people are anyway because the government has become an irrelevance to them. I think the state has become an irrelevance. It's become a hindrance. It's like... Um, I mean, people have said, you know, and you know, you can see it now. We you know, like helping hands at Edinburgh. It said, like, you know, you know, we're we're feeding ourselves. We don't want we don't want anything from the state. We don't expect anything from the state. You've given us fuck all for forty years, so we're feeding ourselves. We're providing all the cultural and recreational activities for ourselves. We're doing the football. We're doing the boxing. We're kind of getting kids out of the house, getting them fit again. Mm -hmm. We're getting them to read again. You know. We don't actually need you bastards for anything. We don't need your money. We don't want money from the council. We don't want, you know, it's, it's solidarity, not charity. And uh, that's the ethos. And it's like people have been pushed into this position, of course. They've been so marginalized and so excluded uh, with, with kind of deindustrialization, mm. being so forgotten about. Yeah. They've had to fend for themselves. But, you know, I think what will happen is that um, communities will increasingly thrive from doing this because yeah. you just you know you don't need somebody that's giving you nothing basically well we've seen that in liverpool you probably say in edinburgh that the community really has uh, sprung up to meet the challenge uh, getting ppe to uh, to all these pensions homes and you see on the internet all the time now uh, it's actually the community who are mobilizing it's not yeah. it's, not all, it, it's yeah. generally the community and, and john ashton the public health expert he was silenced after Hillsborough, but he doesn't care anymore because he's, he's past retirement age, so he hasn't been silenced. He was on Question Time and Newsnight around mid-March saying we should go into lockdown, but they soon shut him up, but you can find him on the internet. You know? Yeah, well, yeah, again, it's, you know, it's like, as you say, it's a community that are coming forward and people are doing it for themselves, you know. Yeah, it's, like, yeah. the, the, it's like kind of... Um, and it's like, again, it's been hijacked by all this kind of guff about wartime spirits and all that. It's not oh. just people working. It's just people kind of um, looking after themselves and each other. It's just common sense because, and it's only happening because the government and the state can't. They're not, you know, yeah. they don't have the will, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the expertise. I mean, they've all been about, it's all been about making money for them and their peers for the last kind of 20, 30 years. Now they've actually got to govern, they've got to do proper governance, they can't do it. There's no yeah. skill, there's no attitude. Yeah, we've got quite a few questions about saying um, what does it actually mean to be working class? I mean, we've had a few questions asking that, you know. 
Um, I don't know really. I mean, it's like kind of. Um, I think it's like um, we live. We live in such. A, we've moved into a post-industrial era now, and you know, you kind of uh, somebody like myself from the old industrial working classes. You know, that kind of of kind of growing up in that kind of culture, but also. The, you know, the culture of music, the culture of football that surrounds itself with that. And, you know, we're in some ways kind of, you know, in some ways remnants of another age. It's like, you know, now, pe now people grow up into a media kind of culture. And I think it's, um, it's more polarised between kind of elites who have access to, to power and, um, and wealth and the rest of the citizens, you know, whether they're kind of um, working class or middle class. Uh, you know, it's, I think that... Um, and even kind of some quite wealthy people, I think, are being pushed into the, you know, the, the group of citizens now. It's like uh, wealth is becoming so polarised between very, very few people and the rest of us. And the rest of us are still getting creamed through the, the whole debt society, you know, getting creamed yeah. through education, um, through um, through healthcare um, and through housing. And that's the way basically the corporate state um, grabs the people's money, they grab it through their kids, you know, they kind of yeah. they, they say, we, we're using your children to get your assets, you know, so mm -hmm. that, that's that's what they're doing, basically. Leading on from that, there's another question. Do you think masculine identity and culture are intrinsically linked? And how has working class masculinity changed in the last 40 years? I think you know with the with the decline of um, industrial industrial society, you have the kind of breakdown of the division of labour, and when you have that, you have the breakdown of the patriarchy, and you can't really. I mean, you can't really if you don't have an industrial environment or an office environment, you can't really sustain the sexist division and, and pay differential d differentials. Everybody's working from home, doing the same thing. You know, they become the whole idea of a of a kind of systematic kind of bias in gender um, becomes kind of um, not even not even I mean it's always unreasonable but it becomes unenforceable there's no and it becomes unsustainable because there's no cultural kind of uh, support for it so I think that um, I think you know that, that, that it's it's a secular thing you know I think that equal equality um, is a secular thing and that's a, that's a, the big problem that elites have is to try to maintain kind of power and maintain the, the, the justification for for the difference. And this is where you get all these fucking weirdos coming out with all these kind of fascistic kind of eugenics kind of fucking shite again, yeah. basically, you know, that kind of 30s Nazi shite to try to justify systems of inequality that can't yeah. really be justified by the kind of economic and technical structures anymore. Here's a, a really in-depth one, uh, which. If you're struggling here, I'm sure it will, Evan. What's your favourite swear word? Um, I like cunt because of the consonants in it. Like, you know, I think it's great the way it just finishes, like, you know, cunt. Yeah. But, yeah, that's your favourite one, yeah. <laughs> uh, you said you've been listening to uh, a lot of music. Any albums you can, you be, you've been listening to? Obviously all your stuff, mate, you yeah. <laughs> know. And uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, this morning they had um, simultaneously played all together now on Radio One, Radio Two, Six Music for the shop workers, which was very brilliant. Was very yeah. Brilliant. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've kind of um, I pick an album. I've got um, all these. I still got the vinyl and CDs there, and I kind of um, I take one out, you know, for, and. I'll sort of, I think, every morning, I think this is great. I had uh, Pink Floyd's medal on last night. Oh, yeah. sure what, I think I did, um, I think I've done Bob Dylan's Blood on the Tracks for, for tonight. And I just look forward to them so much, you know, during the day. I think this is going to be great, you know, and I'm going to, I like that thing when you actually take it out of its sleeve or out of its box and you put it on the turntable and you've got, you read, yeah. read all the sleeve notes. It's almost that kind of sense of ritual that um, it becomes yeah. a proper night, you know, it becomes a proper event, you know, and you think, this is fucking great. And you hear it, you know, you turn over the side and all that, or yeah. you play the second side, and you hear it as like, um, this, you know, as, as it was kind of intended to be played, really. And, um, I mean, it's like, quality-wise, you know, you, you know, all, all the all the kind of, um, all the, the sort of, um, the... The kind of modern mixes of them are much better quality-wise, and it's more as the artists 
other, but there's, there's something about that tactile thing of just holding something, yeah. putting it on, reading the sleeve notes and kind of, um, and it's a photograph album you're holding in your hand as well. You remember and kind of who you were hanging out with, who you were going out with, who you were in love with, who you were kind of, you know, what you were up to, what you were kind of, um, you know, all these things come flying back there. Yeah. Uh, and kids, you can't do that with streaming, can you? You can't do that with streaming. But a bit of going on to, I've been watching normal people, I don't know if you've been watching it, but uh, basically because Groovy Train's in it somewhere along the line. Hey. Groovy Train was in Train Spot originally, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, because he said, oh, I'm not this again on the jukebox or something. And Kevin <laughs> Samson always, Kevin yeah. Samson always said to me, oh, it's bound to be in the film now, but it wasn't in the film, you know. I know, I know, it's terrible, mate. It's terrible. I felt, <laughs> I felt, I felt treacherous about that. I, can't, I find it I even, I even find it difficult to look you in the eye now. <laughs> uh, who's your favourite character of all the ones you've created? Um, I don't know really. Um, I kind of, you know, I like um, I sort of, I like them. I like the kind of. Um, the sort of lovable losers like kind of um, Wee Jaunty from A Decent Ride uh, or, or or Spud from um, Train Spotting uh, yeah. uh, or Wee Gully from um, from Glue. I like guys that are kind of um, they've got kind of got you know <laughs> they've got good hearts and are a bit naive and they always kind of get crushed, unfortunately. Like, but I kind of yeah. like these I like these characters. Yeah. Have you ever um, created a character that you despise? And the oh, the most, the most, most of the bastards, like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce Robertson uh, from Poe, Roy Strang from um, Marvel's Thought Nightmares. I mean, the challenge with these guys is that you kind of, um, you want to be able to empathise with them, you know. It doesn't matter whether you like them or dislike them, as long as you can see where they're coming from and what's kind of shaped them and made them the way they are. Yeah. Um, just saying something... Ask a few questions here. Um, oh yeah, um, this is this is one for me. On v, it's VE day tomorrow. Obviously, going to be hijacked by the Tories. But are you going to? Will you do anything tomorrow, or will you just you know? Um, no, I mean it's like you won't have your hammer and sickle out. I mean, every day is the same, basically. I mean, it's like, I mean, I'll just be get, just getting back to some graft again. It's like sort yeah. of. Um, it's Friday, so we'll probably kind of um, have some kind of weird. Um, I usually kind of um, find some kind of get some food. Uh, one of us in our little kind of um, circle of trust, as we call it, as Americans call it. I've got a friend in America. She goes, uh, "Who's in your circle of trust?" <laughs> <laughs> so, so within my, my and who is circle, in your circle of trust? Uh, oh, I can't tell. It's just classified <laughs> information, mate. You know. Yeah. So, uh, but um, yeah. Uh, so I'll have to kind of. Um, I don't know if it's if it's me to cook in the circle of trust, or if I'm kind of to be the recipient of food from the circle of trust. Yeah. Well, um, Evan, it's always it's always a pleasure. Um, hearing, hearing it's always a pleasure. Who I mean, it's nice. It's funny talking to you here and not being able to have a drink. And oh, uh, yeah, it's well, weird. As I said last time, I was. So you it was you were DJing, weren't you? You know, yeah, that was fun, like yeah. That was exactly a year ago. Yeah, and you drank all my rider. You drank all the mine. It was put out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was getting you back for groovy swinging. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what you've been saying for years, mate. Yeah. But you'll have to um, when it all goes back to normal. You'll have to come down again. Obviously, you do. You've got lots of friends in Liverpool. Um, yeah, yeah, always love coming up, buddy. Can't can't wait to get back down again. Well, I'm right. down from Edinburgh. I come up from London, so we're up, so we're right. up or down wherever I am. Yeah, get your geography sorted. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But, uh, right, I'm going to put in and I'm going to thank you two um, for tonight. It's been an um, absolutely fantastic talk. I have to say, we were a little bit nervous in terms of the um, the tech when we have our live events. We always say it's uh, it's always the tech that kind of gets you, but I think it's stood up tonight, and uh, and I think the uh, you know you, you, the stuff you've talked about there, I think that's really stood up too. So many things to think about there, and uh, we've got the time to think about them, haven't we? You know, with uh, this uh, this moment of lockdown, what we do with it, and you know, it was like I was talking to my partner about it, saying we have to come out of this change in some way or other. And I don't know whether it might have given people a chance to kind of reflect. 
<clears throat> and to see really in motion, in my opinion, you know, this thing about the, the narrative around the lockdown. I saw the chair of the, the Tory 1922 committee bemoan the fact that people were uh, a bit too keen to, uh, to stay at home. And I thought, what, what's a contempt you've got for people? A, a lot of people didn't have the choice because they were locked down and they were uh, furloughed. And secondly, people have a real concern for their own lives. So, you know, there's uh, maybe we've got a chance to kind of look and reflect upon some of these narratives as we see them. And sometimes we're too busy in our lives uh, to be able to, to maybe notice these and, and how they uh, sometimes subtly and often not so subtly uh, put them into uh, into play. Evan reminded me the first time I met him was uh, during the uh, the latter part of a docks dispute in Liverpool that Evan was uh, a supporter of back in 95 to 98. And what came out of that was a film called Dockers that I was lucky enough to be part of and Evan uh, was as well, along with uh, Jimmy McGovern and the team of writers that included eight of the Dockers and four of the women at the waterfront. And the reason I mentioned that is that that's what our festival was born from 20 years um, you know, this year. And unusually for a writing and literary festival, we came out of a struggle and we've always maintained that commitment to social justice in honor really of those people who fought for two and a half years uh, for their rights and did it with absolute dignity. And some of the things that, Pete, uh, that Evan talked about there, which was about the, you know, almost like the DIY culture, you know, the Dockers dispute was incredibly creative and, you know, remains an inspiration to this day. And the other thing I think uh, I liked what Evan said was he's playing Blood on the Tracks tonight, which is my absolutely favourite um, Bob Dylan uh, album, the Tangled Up in Blue being my favourites as well. So I might put that on myself uh, a little bit later. Uh, massive thanks to Peter Hooten for taking part in that and facilitating that and, uh, you know, always being a, a great guest and uh, someone who, you know, takes um, conversations like this to be what they are, just a conversation where you're able to have a little bit of back and forth uh, in, and, and, and provoke and, you know, kind of get people talking and open up ideas um, that I think, you know, will benefit uh, a lot of people. So thanks uh, for that. Thanks to our team who put that together. You know, we had to wind down our festival, which, uh, you know, we normally have about 60 events throughout May. And basically in a week, the team had to wind that down, which was a little bit gutting. But I have to say the response to be able to put together this festival and these events uh, has been absolutely outstanding. And, uh, you know, they deserve a lot of credit for that. As Madeline said, our festival runs until the 31st of May. There's a whole bunch of events on Sunday at 12 noon. We've got A.L. Kennedy with her book aptly titled, We Are Trying, Attempting to Survive Our Time. She's in conversation with Elsa Cox, who was the first ever professor of short fiction in the country based at Edge Hill University. Um, that's part of the big book weekend, which was put together by Kit Deval and a whole team to bring together events from various festivals around the country, some of which are cancelled, some like ours that are going ahead. We have a whole bunch of events taking place for young people and for children, story time events. So tune into them as well. Um, we have won a couple of events on the NHS. One of the things about our festival, we always try and be contemporary and to try and address issues that are pressing concerns. And I think the NHS at the moment has to be the most pressing on so many levels. So we have a documentary called The Great NHS Heist taking place on Tuesday the 12th uh, with a Q&A with Dr. Bob Gill, who uh, created the, uh, the documentary. And we then have one called You Clap For Me Now, um, BAME writers, uh, black and minority ethnic um, uh, people uh, on, and their experiences on the front line. And we have uh, some really interesting people on that, consultants, etc., who know what they're talking about. And I think, you know, it goes right to the heart of the matter in terms of the absolute crisis within the NHS, regardless of the fact the government say that, uh, you know, that they, uh, they, it didn't break the NHS. The NHS, in many senses, is already broken. Um, we then have a letter from America from the legendary political analysis Noam Chomsky. First came to us in 2003 uh, when we contacted him to ask him, would he do this year because there was no travel involved and all of those things. He said he'd been turning away many requests, but that this was special. And uh, we're incredibly proud of that. And I think, you know, Evan, talk, uh, uh, Noam talking about uh, uh, America, 
which obviously reflects upon the world situation, I think is going to be an absolutely standout um, uh, keynote speech from him. And something that I think we need is a reasoned critique of what is taking place uh, in America that is going to affect uh, the whole world. Um, and, and, and Trump's response to the crisis with the coronavirus, where in effect he signaled today it's fine for people to die. Never mind the killer virus. You know, we've, we're, we basically have got a killer in the, uh, the White House. I think Noam will have a lot to say um, about that. And as was announced before, a major guest, we finished with Jeremy Corbyn, ex-leader of the Labour Party, and a call to art. There's so much going on in between, and we hope that you will join us. You'll find all the details on our website, wildfest.uk. Um, we'd ask you, if you would like to, make a donation. The donations are going to be split, uh, some to Wild, but also to the uh, fan support and food banks who are an outstanding organisation coordinating the support for people in need in this city. In the Northwest region alone, there's been something like a 25% increase in cases of domestic abuse and violence. And we are supporting through the donations from this festival, the South Liverpool Domestic uh, Abuse Service, who do you know an absolutely vital job. So please donate through us or just go, go and do, donate to them um, as well. We'll be posting a link up to a feedback form. We'd love to get your feedback. Please um, put that up for us um, as well. And um, we'll see you at the next event, hopefully on Sunday or at uh, different events during the festival. Thanks so much for taking part. Thanks for all of your questions as well. It means a lot to us. It means a lot to us that we've been able to get the festival online and uh, we hope it's uh, something that you appreciate and that you're going to enjoy too so thanks from all at writing on the wall thanks again to peter hooten thanks to Evan welsh and everybody who's been able to put these uh, this event together and we'll see you next time take care and stay oh, stay safe stay in <laughs>